Shiv Sharan Singh, you are the founder of Karam Kriya School. Mm-hmm. You're a yogi. Mm-hmm. How do I refer to you? Do you specifically want to be called a teacher, a mm-hmm. yogi? A... Shiv Charan. I know Shiv Charan. Okay. Yeah. Okay. And you um, are such an inspiration to me. And it's a real honor to be sitting here today. Um, and as student to teacher, uh, it's a real privilege to be able to ask you these questions all about mm-hmm. emotion. So the first question I have is, what is the yogic take on emotional regulation? Okay. First, we might refer to emotional charge, actually, before we say regulation. But there is in us an emotional charge. Uh, we can just play with the word a little bit, emotion, energy in emotion. It's a combination of um, psychic coloring or mental coloring, and it's a combination of organic forces within us. And by the time we experience it, we call it emotion. But emotions happen through glandular changes and other organic kind of movements within us. And of course, by our thought, the projection of our thought into that. It's like if you have water and you color it pink or green or blue, this is your your kind of mental coloring on that uh, force, which we call emotion. So it's a great power and it's not something to be dismissed. It's not something to be classified in some uh, bad way, let's say rather to be harnessed and of course because it is already formulated into many of our patterns accumulated over the the life then there's also a challenge to clean out those patterns and liberate the energy that's within these emotions and make it available for other emotions so uh, you can be angry or you can care Uh, it's this fine line one side is a I'm angry, I'm disturbed because something isn't how it should be, or I really care about this and I want to do something about it. So you use the emotional charge into effective action, or you just let it build in you as a judgment and a prejudice and a resentment or something like that. It's the same energy. It's really the color that we give it, the, the mental projection we put into it. Is there value to a negative charge? By negative, you mean a bad, bad in some way, yeah? I'm asking that because we see uh, negative and positive as, as important parts of the everyday life, and negative for us doesn't necessarily mean bad. It's the power of no. It's the power of instinct. Our, our instincts work first by, oh, this doesn't feel right, there's something not comfortable. That's um, a negative experience, but it doesn't mean it's bad. It's just my instincts guiding me, don't go there, don't eat that. And so for us, negative is, has that meaning. Um, inside, a lot of what we would call bad is actually this simple, very pure negative instinct. And if we would, could identify that, why am I feeling this? What is this telling me? There's something I need to change. Yeah. So if I can identify that and hear what that's really telling me and then move it into the appropriate change in my life, then of course there's a benefit. If I feel bad and I just take medication to not feel bad, you know, there are many ways that I can um, get rid of that bad feeling, but not necessarily resolve the cause of the bad feeling. So it's not the feeling bad is useful or not useful. It's a question of what I'm going to do with it. A lot of people try to escape bad feelings. Yeah, escape, avoid, smother it, cover it, blame others for it. Mm, there's a lot of strategies we have. We've been doing this for thousands of years, so and we get more and more sophisticated. And let's go shopping. Let's put on the TV. Let's call somebody. Let's get onto my screen and start scrolling around. Many things we can do to n- not sit with self and f- dig a bit deeper and find out what's really going on. Yes, yeah? addiction is one way that I know. Well. And the result it becomes addictive, obsessive, compulsive. Um, we become dominated by, we set up patterns, basically, of behavior and patterns of thinking, and our emotional energy then gets shaped into those patterns. 
and then these patterns become self-perpetuating, and then we become ruled and controlled by them. People say controlled by the emotion, but they're really controlled by the form that that emotion has been taking. And if you can uh, discharge the emotion energy and use it in another way, the pattern will start to, to fade away. Quantum science has now proven <clears throat> what yogis have known for thousands of years. Can you tell me more about the technology of Kundalini Yoga and how that pertains to emotional mastery? So we describe Kundalini as a coiled energy at the in a, in a location associated to the base of the spine, and we call it the first chakra. And um, it's like a dormant extra capacity within us. And if we awaken that energy that, and that uh, extra life in us, then um, it un unfolds different faculties in our being, different levels of awareness um, and perception and increases intuition, increases our resilience and strength to deal with life and, and everything it brings us. The technology, that it's a bit voluminous really to go into all the detail about that and there are many books written about it, but generally speaking we identify left and right channels within our body and the central channel which represents it through the spine and it's a gathering like a gathering of negatives and positives and collecting them within us, uh, meaning in our navel area, we call it Nabi, and uh, bringing that to the base of the spine and rising through the central channel. This is a simple uh, description and there's a lot of different techniques that work for that. What has that got to do with emotional energy? Um, so it's not always um, the best thing in the sense of people play around and stimulate or uh, even though they don't do it themselves, life's circumstances might stimulate uh, movements within us. And if it doesn't really go in a guided or structured way, it can result in phenomena that is not so uh, healthy for the individual and maybe also impacts upon the social relationships that that person has. So people will get into extreme depressions or extreme hysterias and, uh, or the, the rising uh, energy in us comes up too, up too quickly and then it opens up kind of higher centers of perception and then we're kind of uh, tapping into kind of psychic energies around us and you know, the mental field, the, the mind field and, and we have no filter and um, no way uh, of regulation. So. It's something that should be approached kind of systematically, uh, slowly and gently, guided, strongly recommended that one would have a teacher uh, and a body of teachings and a systematic technology to work with. Um, things like drugs or even just an accident or a shock or a trauma might stimulate us into these different states, but then we don't have the means to uh, integrate that and it's not something that's generated by your own practice is generated by exterior forces or ingestion of a substance. And therefore, it's not something that's under your command, really. So, um, if we talk about emotional energy, um, it's, not, it's not a direct relationship, mm -hmm. really, because anybody has emotions. Mm -hmm. Some people have some more... Uh, vitality. Some people have more sense of authority about them. Why is that? You know, things are moved in them in a different way. And uh, this is not necessarily uh, motion. Yeah? One can raise the Kundalini through the spine, through all the chakras into a very high level of perception, but become very tyrannical and manipulative and controlling. And that may be because there's a lack of emotional intelligence, a lack of uh, emotional sensitivity. How can yeah. yoga help us master our emotions? Okay. So that's that's not then only the practice of raising Kundalini, it's about opening the chakras, for example, the heart. Chakras are important. In our tradition, we're saying raise the Kundalini, open the centers, the chakras, but in order 
to then bring in the light, bring in consciousness, bring in spirit, so that we are, that's what gives you the sensitivity, yeah, rather than just raising Kundalini. Uh, it's, it's rather than what happens next is where the emotional intelligence comes in. And uh, often people talk about the heart as the place of compassion. It's not that the heart is the source of compassion, but it's the receiver of compassion. Because before I can be compassionate to anybody, I must receive compassion into myself. And so, um, I imagine our, our teacher will often say, first compassion to self, then you can be compassion to others. Compassion to self is not me trying to hug me and stroke me and that kind of thing. It's re rather I accept from the, I'm, I'm a, in a personal existence and I need to receive impersonally in order to then share personally with others. It's something we might refer to as higher emotions. Uh, we talk about the body made of five elements, let's say, or called tattvas in yoga. And each tattva, each element itself produces emotion in us as well. Um, earth element, frustration, for example, but also resting on the earth. So the sense of peace can also come through that. So each of these tattvas can provide us with something like a higher emotion, uh, an emotion that's more associated to consciousness and spirit, or an emotion that is more just impulsive and um, very much shaped and constructed through our experience, our karmas, and, and our mistaken identity, mistaken understanding. So the water element will give me depression and associated kind of feelings, sorrow, but within that is the, what we call the loving of the soul. Uh, the water element may be associated with, with a desire or passion as well. Um, and if there's no passion, there can't be compassion. So everything can have its transformation and everything can be uh, found in a higher uh, level. So learning to bring in higher emotions, um, sense of um, kindness and forgiveness. Yeah? So it's one thing to have self-care. It's another thing to extend that care to others. It's another thing to extend that care to the level of where you can overlook a person's limits or shortcomings, uh, which we call pre-forgiveness, rather than just be forgiving, um, but pre-forgiving. And that gives a lot more space for the other person to mature and become uh, something more than just they're, they're, they're held in my vision as the guilty one or something like that. It doesn't give them space to, to be more than that. So, uh, and compassion and uh, tolerance and patience also are uh, we consider it as, as a higher intelligence in a way that then can capture the emotional force in me that that charge we talked about and uh, and reshape it. Are our emotions a GPS in a way, in in terms of leading us to say, helping us burn off karma? It's not the emotions, this is your uh, consciousness really that's going to do that. And that's going to do that, what we call the arc lane. So before you reach to the aura, you have a, like antennae, so that gives intuitive sensitivity and it gives you presence. If I'm conscious, I'm present. If I'm present, I'm conscious. And if I'm present, I have presence so that I can be tuning in to which way the wind is blowing, know what's coming before it comes, and already be um, adjusting myself into a responsive relationship rather than a reactive relationship to, to what is coming. So it's not the emotions that are the GPS, but rather it's your uh, consciousness when it's present in intuitive presence. In lectures the last few days you mentioned the neutral mind the positive mind and the negative mind and yeah. i was actually surprised that you said now if you're in a neutral mind you might feel a lot mm -hmm. um and you also talked about the negative mind being the subconscious can you go in just briefly mm -hmm. to how that works okay so we spoke earlier about negative and negative doesn't mean bad negative is an instinctive uh, capacity and force in us 
and that is organic. Let's say animals, even plants, have a degree of kind of instinctive. Uh, yeah, if, if you feel ill, your your little flower, you know, your your bedside window will also kind of reflect that in some kind of we call it a empathetic kind of resonance. Yeah. So this instinct uh, of the negative is already there. I don't know what's good for me, but I know it's not good for me. That's a purely instinctive faculty. We as human beings have been very much out of touch with that, and there's a reason why that's been the case. Because you know, what, otherwise, why would we be eating junk food? You know, why do we do what we do to our, our bodies? You know, and abuse it in so many ways and and uh, pollute the environment and and seem to just not care. You know, and carry on. So that there was a certain disconnect from the instinctive nature in order to uh, develop on another level. Uh, we didn't have enough energy to do all things at the same time. So we focused a lot on the human and the consciousness and the community uh, spirit and so on. And, and uh, we're reaching to the point where we've developed enough consciousness that we want to come back into a conscious contact to our instincts. So a lot of people are talking about, listen to your body, you know? body has an intelligence in it, it can guide you, uh, which is good news, but we have to be cautious on the way, because at the moment, the body is also full of a lot of corrupt information from the lifestyle we've had, so there needs to be a detox, there needs to be a cleansing, and we call that cleaning the subconscious, whether that's through certain diets, uh, certain meditations, process meditations especially, that do a cleansing, so that our, we can come back to a purer uh, and conscious connection to the instinct. The child has it. A, a young baby, when there's a, something out of harmony, the baby will make a noise. You know, there'll be an expression of the negative condition, and then it calls attention to itself. So this is already there. The child has an innocence. child has a simple, naive trust in, in the life and the people around it. But as we grow up, we lose that contact. And it's, it's necessary because we don't know we have it. So we have to lose it and then come back to connect to it again but in a conscious manner. But that's quite a long journey and a lot of work needed uh, to do that. Yeah. So that's the subconscious. Uh, Brilliant. Perfect. Journey. And yeah. that leads me to the notion of separation. Yeah. Is separation real? And is that the source of suffering? Separation is not real in the deep sense of the word. Everything is connected, and uh, we have the same blood in our bones, and the same, you know, color of bones are the same. We walk on the same earth, we breathe the same air, we're on the same planet. There are many ways in which it's impossible to say we're in some kind of isolated, disconnected state. In fact, nobody could live in that. You know, if you were separated, just try it out. You know, block your nostrils, block your mouth, and see how long you live in that closed bubble. But um, we, in, in the, what we might call the field of Maya, of the Venus, three qualities, and the uh, field of time and space, and longitude and latitude of Earth, we have a distorted perception. And part of that distorted perception is a sense of separation, okay? And that's necessary to have that in order to build within that bubble uh, a deeper, a crystallization of your true identity, of your um, spiritual identity, let's say. The positive mind is a domain that not many people use the term, the semi-conscious domain. And this is the domain of the positive mind, which is our everyday capacity just to function and affirm, yes, I'm here, yes, I see you, yes, I'm okay, uh, yes, I'll be there for the appointment, and so on. All our general, everyday yeses. Um, the problem is that the positive mind is also the busy part of ourselves, and it will be also affirming. It will affirm anything, because it wants to be busy and affirm things. So if it's got some message from either from internal dialogue or from interpretation of signals from the environment, usually starting with our parental environment, of something... Um, against self, then the positive mind will also affirm that. Yes, you're in shame. Yes, you're guilty. Yes, you don't deserve. Yes, uh, nobody loves you. Yes, you're 
you know, uh, guilty or whatever. So the positive mind is also just busy affirming whatever it can affirm. This is very important to um, go through a kind of unlearning and a relearning. Uh, you have to have an alternative. It's not enough to say, don't do shame or don't do uh, resentment or don't do victim. You need to have an alternative where you say, what you're doing is dead. And you can be busy losing a lot of time trying to clean out the shame, but you're leaving a vacuum. So it's very important not to leave a vacuum, but to have immediately, instead of shame, I'm going to do this. And what is this? How am I going to give a good affirmation to myself, not only through words, internal dialogue, through the way I breathe, dress, speak, but also in my action. Because the positive mind is to take the emotional charge and put it into action. Okay, when I work with that, clean the negative so I have healthy instinct, so that even you put food on the table, I immediately know this is not for me, and this is okay for me, and that kind of thing, and, and my behavior. A lot of problems we have is because we see something that needs to change, but we don't take action. Positive mind should guide me into effective action, and I, if I have, can have emotionality about something, it, people say, oh, I don't have energy. Well, you have energy to be angry. How can you not have energy? The problem is your energy is invested in that pattern. And that's an emotional charge. So you need to captivate that and you need to give it another expression and manifestation. And when that is working, that sets a foundation for opening up to a wider sentience, actually, as a sensory experience of self. And to enjoy that, enjoy all the sensations and experiences of life, but without identifying with or being attached to or lost in, because you have had this stabilization. So remember we said the separation is also a temporary delusion within which, now, and we can be lost in that for the whole life and just suffer from it, or we can utilize it to, like a cocoon, you know, you have to produce the butterfly inside the cocoon, then you can have the breakdown of the cocoon, yeah? If there's no chicken in the egg and you break the egg open, from the outside doesn't work, sort of break from the inside. But right now, I'm an egg. I don't know anything else, I'm an egg. So you're trying to tell me I have to have a breakdown, it's not gonna work, yeah? But when it builds in me, what we might call then the negative sense of, of something's wrong, you know? Or signs or symptoms that I'm not being able to hold on to my construct, constructed identity, that cocoon, which is a bit like an ego cocoon in a way, sooner or later that cocoon must break, and then the authentic self can take that space, like a butterfly born out of the cocoon or the bird out of the egg. Um, but it, and if we've gone through the journey in a good way, then when that moment comes, we can hold ourselves present, without attachment, not detaching, because that's a false neutrality, not identified with or lost in, but in what we might call a non-attached state where life is rich in emotion and experience and feeling, but we're not pulled all over the place and we don't have to panic and shut down and, and, and avoid either. These are the kind of two extremes. Yeah. That's an interesting clarification for me because I think a lot of people think that to achieve enlightenment means you don't feel anything at all. And this is not true. Why shouldn't you feel ecstasy? Oh, yeah. Yeah, what's the point of having a sensory existence and not feel? Those same enlightened people might say, oh, it's all about love. Well, love is also a feeling. Love is also an experience. Now, if we can achieve this kind of transformation, yes. does it affect our DNA? It will. It will, yes. Does it affect our electromagnetic field, which Kundalini Yoga does with The electromagnetic field is, um, you can work in two ways. You can work on your electromagnetic field and it will impact upon your, your DNA. You can go through a DNA uh, change and that will impact on the magnetic field. It will work in both directions. That's something I appreciate about the practice we do is very comprehensive so that it, like, come from the mind to the body, from the body to the mind, from the inside to the outside, from the outside to the inside, work in every direction. We're in the times when we need to switch on every uh, means we can and, and get the job done. So, 
you talk about the body as being a stringed instrument. Can that also tune into the magnetic field of Earth? And in that way, if I heal myself, am I actually making a contribution <clears throat> to the collective? Yeah. It's not only that it can tune in, it does, but we're not conscious of it. People suffer consequences and don't realize that those what they're experiencing is how much they're subjected to forces around them. That may be even just a small collective, you're in a group of people. And when that group has enough connection with each other, you have a, a group magnetic field. And that magnetic field is going to impact upon you if you're in that company. That's one reason why we say you become the company you keep. So we are all magnetic fields inside various strata of magnetic fields, your family, your village, your nation, uh, your grouping that you identify with, you know. So there are multiple layers. And again, as we said earlier, it goes two ways. How much, one of what we teach through Kalini Yoga, why we do teacher training, not just teach yoga, but actually train teachers because we want to see that people can move from being influenced. And the first step is to kind of create a space inside of you, a stress-free kind of zone where you're less impacted. And then as you go more deeper into your own self-becoming, well, you can start to impact into your environment and, and therefore make a change first in your locality and then in a broader and broader sense, depending on each individual. But of course, when we have, if we do that collectively, then the impact will be much uh, broader. The only thing I like to be a little careful of is sometimes we can get a little lost in uh, we're going to save the world kind of um, trip, yeah, which, you know, good intention is there, and I respect that very much. But the world needs to go through what it's going through, the upheavals and the confusions and the, even what we might call tragedies. We don't necessarily see the bigger picture as to why all this is happening. We're quick to blame whether it's the patriarchal culture, and it's certainly had its contribution to make, and the Piscean era, etc. So a lot of forces have contributed, but we are not the singular cause of all of these things. And there are other forces at work. And as you might have said yourself, that sometimes we need to go through some breakdown or tragedy or crisis in life in order to come through to something clearer and more authentic. So that works. Yeah, microcosm, macrocosm, what's working for the individual is also working for the collective. So we can't necessarily, um, I see that you're heading for a crash, let's say, and I try to save you, but I may have actually done a damage because you may be needed to have that crash in order to have a wake up. So I need to be clear, but my intuition has to function very well to know, is, it, is this crash going to serve you? I'm going to step back but I'll be there to talk it through with you once you come out the other end and help you realize what you've just been through and what you can do with it. But uh, if I think it's not going to serve you for that, then I may need to uh, put something in your way and say, hey, whoa, don't do this. This is not going to serve you and see whether we can navigate another way. A lot of people are rolling on a roller coaster of different things, including let's save the world and the Earth's magnetic field. When... Uh, they may not be fully tuned in as to what's really, really needed right now. And I'm, I'm not claiming anything about my own perceptions or knowing. I'm just saying I can see that we need caution here as to how much we need to allow what's happening to happen and how much we need to take responsibility for our contribution to what is happening and, and bring an appropriate influence. We all bring influence, so we should take responsibility for our influence but not overextend our sense of what the influence can be or should be. Yes, it's a, it's a balance, a very fine yeah. balance, and it's an art to My rock bottom is the it, but best thing that ever happened to me. Of course, absolutely. And absolutely. I needed that. Yeah. Self-initiation. Mm -hmm. What's the purpose of initiation? Initiation is uh, really like a doorway uh, where we're moving from something is over, something is finished, and a new beginning is needed. And that requires a divergence of what was, that's the breakdown kind of phenomena, and a convergence of something new. If you have the breakdown and you don't have a convergence, 
then you only have a breakdown. Then you have a casualty, and then you need all the support systems for that person. So we, we can't automatically say any breakdown is a good breakdown, yeah, because there are casualties of these phenomena. But generally, the idea that the possibility is there that um, the something can converge and, and a new beginning. And the, the very core of that is that that convergence is a convergence of self. So we say self-initiation, meaning I'm the one who has to initiate the change. The self-initiation also means that I initiate a new sense of self. You know, it's also meaning, meaning that way. So this is um, enough of a crystallization in order to then um, come through that door of change and, and be strong from it, you know? Do you think we're experiencing a collective awakening right now? Well, there's no doubt about that. There is, again, growth from the inside and from exterior forces. This is a time of uh, consciousness and, and change and conscious change and change that is trying to uh, aggravate us towards consciousness in a way. So there's no question about that. Yeah. You talk about emotional devotion and emotional commotion. What we say is taking that emotional charge and if we, because it, it has to go somewhere and take a shape and by default it takes shape of drama, soap opera, and that we call commotion. Yeah. And um, we will not get out of that unless we have another channel. And that is the meaning of devotion. And that may come through service to others. It may come through bhakti in the sense of an altar or a spiritual reference. But there has to be emotion to devotion if you want to get out of emotional commotion. This is absolutely. I wanted to go yeah. a little bit further into addiction. What is addiction? You talk about unsatisfied desire. Okay, there's two sides to that. Um, the word addict means um, to be enslaved in a way. Yeah, dict, addict, I'm dictated. Yeah, so I, whatever it is, whether it's a gambling pattern, is it the pattern or the substance that I'm taking, whatever it is, has become an entity in itself and it dictates to me my thinking, my behavior, my sense of self. But how did I get into that? Is, yes, um, the very root, the pure root, is because there's a desire. And the traditional uh, religion, religious teachings in its exoteric form, has turned that into something wrong and evil, and desire is bad, so cut it off and deny it, reject it. And, um, but we see the results of that often produces something much more insidious. So consciousness will say, you know, Desire is there. There is the thirst of the soul. And this world will only satisfy my sense of need to 20%. And the 80%, it is, it is infinity. You know, it's a desire for the infinite. And only the infinite can fulfill that. And then we each in our own way need to find out how we might do that. And the original practices of religion, amongst other things, was to be able to harness that emotional energy and tied into the cosmos in a way and have glory and praise and, and, and that ecstasy. But if a religion tells you it's wrong to laugh or to dance or to sing or to be creative, then it's, it's equal to saying cut off your, your emotional energy, which then means cut off the fact that you will desire, which then results in a deviated and perverse expression of that desire. So we, we must work on coming back to, to conscious responsibility for that desire energy and that longing and, and invest it in other ways. You're a numerology expert. Can we put numbers to our emotions? Everything has numbers. Numbers are the very backbone of existence. If you would just pause for a moment and think, can there be a world without number? And it will be quite evident that it cannot be. So therefore, number is like an invisible abstract spine, you know, within everything. If you put the num take out the number, you like pulling the magic carpet out from underneath the, the world, it won't exist. So there's a, co in every material thing, there's a corresponding reference in the abstract domain, and the abstract domain, it, most abstract is number itself. So there will always be a correspondence, and that is going to include uh, emotion. Every emotion will have some uh, singular or combination 
of uh, number of intelligence within it, absolutely. Similar yes. to that, do emotions also have, say, shape? And I mean that in terms of sacred geometry. Sort of, if you okay. were to see it first in the all, ether. Uh, yeah, first of all, there's the shape that we've given it through our stories, our projections, our beliefs, our fears, and so on, false hopes, etc. We have shaped emotional energy. So, sacred geometry, you know, why it's even called sacred in the first place? Because it's uh, actually the, the universe has its own inherent geometry in it. And we see that in the plants, we see that in the spiral of the shell, we see that in so many places, uh, even the proportion of the parts of the body. Everything has some natural geometry to it. We talk about the golden mean, the series, Fibonacci series, and these kind of things. They are inherent. Okay, so it's if we will align ourselves to the natural geometry, if we will let our emotion move into that natural geometry, then that uh, becomes emotion to devotion. We devote to that which is the case. So instead of being dictated to by my uh, phantom, by my ghosts, by my trauma uh, memories, by my addictive pattern around an object or a substance or a person or anything else, I rather let me be dictated to by the natural order. And that is a geometry both of time and space, how time unfolds and its cycles and its rhythms and the, the, the way things naturally form in space. And if we would tune into that and harmonize our lives into that way, then uh, we will feel the glory, we will feel the connectedness. Um, traditionally, people did things like you know building their cathedrals, for example, was a way to try to make a construction that was based on this natural order, so that even just by stepping into those places, one would already uh, feel some kind of harmony. Remember, we are influenced by our environment. Then they, the, the masters uh, would do things like construct gardens, in certain formations and the labyrinths, and as you would follow that path, uh, you would also be, uh, it would awaken in you that latent knowing of that geometry in yourself, and you would feel the beauty, and you would feel the harmony, and you would feel the connection, and the disconnection would be over. But if you have not internally initiated yourself towards the unfolding of your inner potential, which is self-initiation, which needs Kundalini, part of what Kundalini is, is that extra power to achieve that transition. You know, if you don't have that power and you have a breakdown, you don't have the power to go through that to, to something more. Many people will describe their breakdowns with, with phenomena that also represents Kundalini phenomena. And when that's absent, actually the person doesn't find the, the, the will or the courage to actually uh, come out with some, you know, something new or renewal have to break down, but they end up just being a victim and post-traumatic stress disorder and so on because they didn't have something more to take them through. So bringing Kundalini to people who've had post-traumatic uh, experiences and, and uh, could actually help them to, to reformulate their experience into something new. Can you talk to me really briefly, two more questions. Is emotion uh, the language of the cosmos? It's an image of your soul, so that your soul can relate to the cosmos. That's so beautiful. It's almost made me cry. Um, breath, you mentioned as being so powerful with regulating our emotions. Yes. Can you just... Yes. Yes. Um, Let's remember that um, is one of the few things that distinguish us from animals uh, in the world. And um, this body is just a body of an animal. But it's inhabited by a consciousness. Um, even an animal has anima, has soul in it. But the human soul has matured to the level of consciousness where we can actually take control of our breath. And we can uh, choose to now, choose to exhale. We can uh, count the, the, the segments of the breath. We can hold it, we can hold it in, hold it out. We can breathe through nose, breathe through mouth. A lot of moderations we can do. And each of those moderations change our neurological state our state of our nervous system, state of our glandular system. So remember, emotions are linked into organic kind of uh, movements as well. 
So we can uh, regulate ourselves completely if we will regulate through the breath. And two things that are, are kind of wrapped around that is the use of, of my navel, my nabi area, that the breath must be anchored and connected into the navel area. And the other is what we call mantra, man is a mind, that arm is to vibrate. So set the mind onto a frequency and a vibration that harmonizes with the breathing. Breathing is grounded into the physical center of gravity in the navel area. And this is yoga is a union. So you bring you into a union in yourself. And if you don't have that union in yourself, we don't, can't talk about union with the cosmos. Yeah, that union only comes about because we go in our own union. There's not just any kind of breathing. This goes back a little bit to the question of geometry because uh, those people who have had that sensory awareness of that geometry would be able to identify certain rhythms and patterns of breathing as well as produce certain poetry or mantras that are within that natural geometry so that when I will then breathe and chant within that form, that order, then that, and that means with also my emotional chant. It's not enough just to recite like a parrot. We also have to say that the emotions are the language of the soul. So it's one thing is the technology. That's why some people may go in a cathedral or a sacred garden and feel nothing, you know, because if there's not the connectedness to the sensory self, which is through neutral uh, quality within your heart, uh, with that sensitivity, and then the practice is done with all that emotion, then the combination of the technology and the emotion into the devotion will produce uh, everything, absolutely everything can, can transform around you, not only within you, but your environment, people who come in your company will feel the difference. Uh, yes. That's how to make the mind, um, said if your mind's a master, it's a monster, so there's that. Exactly. If you can capture the, the, the mind to the breath, then it's, it's a very powerful tool that has faculties. It's like a toolbox. But if I have not had any training, then these faculties of my mind, they dictate to me rather than I use those faculties to serve a greater purpose. But I have to capture the mind. One little thing here, a lot of people do meditation and practices and they take uh, silent retreats and they do things, but many times you have to be careful. Am I only taking a holiday from my mind or am I transforming my mind? So we do talk about that in our teaching where if, um, if you just take a vacation like anybody would do, Oh, it's so nice, lie on the beach and enjoy. But you know, Monday morning back at work, it's like all the same patterns are there, all the reactions are there. And already by lunchtime, you're saying, I need a holiday. And you know, the mom goes in the yoga room, lights her candle, burns the incense, puts on nice music, meditates. The minute she's out the door, she's shouting at the children again. I said, Mom, well, you just meditated. What was that for? So it's, it's, uh, fine to take those vacations, but sooner or later we have to say, wait a minute, I may be switching off temporarily, but I'm not changing the program. So I'm actually still subject to my mind. The minute my mind is switched back on, which it needs to be to function in the everyday world, then it's already controlling me again. I need to use my time out from the world to actually capture my mind and conquer my mind, like training a dog, you know, with bad habits and say, mind, this is your job. I don't talk my mind. I'm going to talk to my mind. I'm going to say, mind, here's your place. And this is what I need of you. No, not that, this. And it will take time because the mind is like, we say, a, a, an old dog, you know, with habits and, that have been around a long time. And it takes a bit of work to change. And not everybody is willing to do that work. But uh, if you will, and the mind will fight to keep us control as well. So... There's a, there's a journey to make where you really get um, that command of your mind and uh, use its faculties in good service, and the mind should not dictate to you. Yeah. Okay, beautiful. Sat so, now. Well, I do. And it's an absolute pleasure and a blessing and an mm -hmm. honor. Um, I really appreciate it. You've put everything together for me mm -hmm. in these last few days, and especially mm -hmm. in this interview. And um, I'm so incredibly grateful.
Ouais, bien sûr. 